Hi folks, it's Brendan Chaplin here and today I wanted to just go through some steps to get athletes and sports teams, fitness enthusiasts, sports people literally knocking at your door begging you to coach them and that's a pretty cool scenario to be in but it does take some time and I want to talk from first-hand experience here of, of actually really mistakes that I've made having no guidance at all and just playing and trying stuff. And uh, the first sort of point of reference for me on this was really one of my first ventures into the strength and conditioning business world and it was a company I set up called Dynamic Athletics. And I remember very vividly the passion that I had at the time and when I set this up because I thought it was going to be the next big thing. And I'd been to the States and I'd had a look at some of the facilities there. And I set up, I set, managed to, to negotiate a contract with Leeds City Council to base myself out of the South Leeds Stadium which was a really good venue. I'd sort of brokered the deal with one of the managers there and then some of the other decision makers. And it had taken me quite a few months, but it had happened. I had the equipment made. I had some sleds built. I had some squat racks built. I had some dumbbells and kettlebells and barbells ordered. I had the banners done. And they were on the outside of the stadium, dynamic athletics. And lo and behold, you can see how, I, how where I've come. My slogan was strength and conditioning to accelerate your development. I had some pictures of sessions and athletes in there that I'd worked with, and you know that kind of stuff on my marketing. I had about twenty thousand flyers made that looked really cool. Um, but a real passion for what I was doing. And um, and guess what? Well, in about three months, I had about three customers. And it really taught me a lesson because I genuinely thought, you know what, this is what it's all about. I'm ready to go. I'm a good coach. You know, I've, I've done this, I've done that. I was about 20, 21 at the time. So 10 years ago. And um, And literally no one wanted to know me. And I kind of thought, what am I doing wrong here? This is this is not fair. Almost, I'm, I believe in what I'm doing, but they're not kind of believing in me. And um, and it def definitely taught me a lesson of, you know, nobody cares about you unless you put the unless you kind of create that desire to train with you. No, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you're not shouting that and you're not telling people and you're not communicating your message, they're not going to know how good you are. They're not going to know who you are. And actually at the time when I was first starting out, you know, I genuinely did not understand the concept of marketing. I was very much operating in a, a mindset of if I build it, they will come. And I was operating in a mindset of a coach and not a business owner. And they, those two things right there are the biggest two mistakes that I have made and you can make as well. That they are just not the mindset that you need to have when it comes to business success and getting people in the door. And unfortunately, no matter how much you, you, you try to avoid that concept, you are a business owner and you do have to get people in you, into your gym or into your business or get customers. So, you cannot be the best coach in the world if you never coached anyone. And these next steps that I'm going to take you through really will basically guarantee that you get a steady stream of clients that you want, the right people, through the doors. And I'm going to share some experience of how I... I've done it in the past and you know, got to a position where I've had six 
other coaches working for me, delivering my sessions and um, and building up a great business that way um, and, and really just kind of take it to the next level for you so you can do the same. So really I think the first thing in this whole process is you've got to define what you want with this and what success looks like for you. For example, if you are wanting to coach yourself, say 30, 40 hours a week and that's your lot, you're happy with that, that's a very different model than if you're saying, well, I want to have, I want to open 30 gyms around the country in the next five years and then sell out for 20 million. That's a hugely different model. Um, you, you also need to have a think about sort of what it, what is it from a financial perspective that you want. Because if you're saying that you want to coach 20 hours a week, and that's all you want to do, but you also want to sell out for 20 million in five years, then there's a disconnect there between your behavior and your goals and actually what you want out of this. Because your behavior has to be congruent with your goals. How can you achieve that big dream if your behavior doesn't change and improve over the course of the next five to ten years? So the first part in this whole process is actually what do you want and what does success look like for you? That's quite an individual thing, but I would encourage you to think big with it. There's no reason why you can't achieve massive things. And most people... As I've said before, most people underestimate what they can actually achieve in a decade, but they overestimate what they can do next week. So set your goals big, work backwards, but actually be realistic with how you manage your time and, and, the, and the output that you can produce on a weekly basis. Step one, really just zone in on that. What does success look like for you and define it? Get it written down. Step two, this is really about your client base. Who do you really want to work with and how do you want to work with them? And when I first started out, my passion, and it still is predominantly, but my passion was literally all about athletes. I did not have any desire to work with the general public or anyone else that wasn't really interested in sports training of some kind. And I spent, and still have, I'm still spending it now, 10 years refining my methods, keeping on learning, and taking things to another level. So I, I know who I want to work with. But there's also a question of how you want to work with them. And these, this, for me, this has changed a lot. And um, so, for example, do you want to work one-on-one -on -one with people? Do you want to work with teams? Do you want to work in small groups? Do you want to work online? Do you want to have a hybrid approach where you have a little bit of all of those things? And I think when you're first starting out, it's okay to, to not necessarily have that total answer, but just to enjoy the process of learning what you enjoy. But I think as clear as you can be, you need to have an idea of who you really want to work with because that has a bearing on your marketing and who you target with this. And for the sake of this short presentation, I'm going to assume that you're a little bit down my side and you want to work with sports people, athletes, teams, etc. And we can then target that with the next few steps. But this model, this step-by-step -step approach, doesn't matter who you work, want to work with, it works for anyone. And when you've decided who you want to work with, the next step, step is building your contacts map. And this is not just a process of listing all the sports teams in the whole city. There's a bit of a strategy here. Because, firstly, you've got to decide who you want to work with. Then you've got to look at where those people are. So, 
if you want to work with triathletes, where do they hang out? Where do they where do they do their sessions? Are they active on social media? All the areas that you potentially could reach those people with your marketing. Then you got to look at kind of what their activity profile is and what and what they are in general. And then you got to look at how you're going to reach them off the back of that. And when you build this contact map, really go to town on it. Get as many as you can. And then we can put some strategy into this. So the first step is literally get the names of the team or the club or the athlete or the individual. The second step is get their contact details, their email address, their website, their Twitter, their Facebook. And this is quite a task, as you can see here. The third step is then, if it's a club or a team, is who are, who are the decision makers in that team? Who's going to give you an opportunity there? Whose decision is it to say, yeah, we'll give you that opportunity? And then you need to get that person down. And then once you've got that information, we can start to put a little bit of a strategy in place. So imagine you've now got a huge spreadsheet in front of you with all the rugby teams, the football teams, the cricket teams, the triathletes, the golfers, the tennis clubs, the tennis coaches, the golf coaches, etc., etc. Now, of course, you're going to put more effort into the, the people that you've identified in step one that you really want to work with. Well, you've got this big list now. Now you've got to look at how to approach them because you can't just blindly send out 500 emails that you know are the same email you're just asking for nothing back in return so the first step in this contact map strategy is to identify who you've worked with before and that can be split into two categories who you've worked with before that's paid you some money for your time and who you've worked with before that's not paid you but you've worked with them for free maybe you're trying to get experience etc so the people who have paid you before and you might not be working with them now or you might be working with them now but those people are people that you really want to start reactivating and getting back into them and that is basically a follow-up campaign contacting them about your services, about what you're doing, about repositioning yourself as a this an expert in this industry, etc., etc. The people who are unpaid, you've just got to approach them in a slightly different way and explain to them that you're now a business, that you're now a business owner, and you're offering these services, do they have any contacts, etc., etc., but you've got to look through that list of people who are unpaid and actually think, is this a worthwhile use of my time to contact these people who didn't pay me anything? They might not have any money to pay or they might not have many referrals that they can give me that will be able to afford it either. It's absolutely fine working for free and giving back and sharing expertise. But at this stage, we're talking about building a business and getting you a shed load of clients to take you up the ladder. And that's not the way to do it at this stage. And then, once you've put some strategy on, on uh, sorry, once you've identified the people that you've, you've worked with and, and they're, they've either paid you or not paid you, that's a great first starting point because they know who you are and they can help you out and, and, and work with you a little bit and, and um, they trust you, they like you and they trust you. The second stage on the contacts map is is people who you'd really like to work with the most in there. So prioritise it. It might be the local triathlon club. It might be the uh, local golf coach who you need to get in with. And have a think about where the money is in that list as well. If you've listed out rugby league teams and in the next column you've got golf coaches, I can tell you right now, 
that the golf coaches are going to be able to give you more money than those rugby league teams, just the way it is. Unless you're talking about professional rugby league, and that's a wholly, totally different ball game as well. So your money is in triathlon, cycling, tennis, golf, athletics. It's in individual marketing. You service to individual sports athletes, sports team athletes like rugby players and football players who've got money to pay. It's in approaching teams for a team conditioning session where they all pay five or ten pounds per session. That's where your money is and, and not unfortunately in Sunday League rugby league teams that you, you, you're just really never going to get anywhere with those guys. And, um, and once you've then prioritised your efforts from a monetary perspective for the teams and the individuals and the athletes that you've not worked with before, you can then actually go at it and start attacking this. And that's where we get to the how. And it's how you approach these individuals and these teams and these athletes. And the how is actually very, very simple. First thing is, where do they hang out and, and how can you find them? So you can't identify, you can't just blanket statement say that you're going to use Facebook ads or Google or, or social media or Twitter if your audience doesn't use those medias. And um, that's the first piece of research you've got to do. So let's take your local triathlon club. Where do they train? How do they communicate with each other? Do they have a Facebook group? Who's the head coach? Who's the key decision maker in there? Who are the influential athletes? And how you then approach them? Well, you might literally ring up the head coach and say, Hi, I'm Brendan Chaplin. I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I'd love to help you with your athletes. Would it be possible to catch up and, and have a chat with you in person? But, but it's also important to think about the language those, those sports speak when you're crafting your message. And that's something that we'll get to in the next step of this whole process as well. But really, how you communicate with these people is very much down to what you're comfortable with. And if you're able to get down to the track, get down to the gym, get down to the session, get down to the field and present yourself, then that's a massive, massive bonus for creating a presence for yourself as well. So that's how we use the contacts map. We, we strategize it. We take it from who you're working with now to who you'd like to work with, where the money's at, and then we put a system in place of tackling all this. Step four, as an aside, is very much about what are you doing now to attract or put off these people. And this is about reviewing where you're at currently. Because if you are trying to market to golf clubs, to tennis clubs, and you're talking about beasting people and you're talking about heavy lifting and strength training, that's the wrong language to talk to those people in. You've got to understand the way they communicate. Golfers and tennis players don't want to hear about getting smashed in the gym and beasted. Now, you might well do that and they might very well need that, but it's not the way to communicate to their coaches and their parents and, their, and them as athletes, perhaps. The stakeholders that are going to make the decisions. They're also going to probably check out your website, and if your website's not up to scratch, if it doesn't portray you in the right light, then you're going to struggle to get their business as well, so it's going to put them off. If your website's adorned with pictures of distance runners and you're trying to market yourself to rugby teams or rugby players, they're not going to be turned on by that. They need to see pictures of people lifting and people training and content, etc., etc., so it's about your positioning and if it's right. Are you actually going to 
excite these people to say, well, we could work with him, we could work with her. She's brilliant. She looks awesome. I'd like to see her. You know, I'd like to get get kind of more time in the gym with him. Is your positioning right? Really review that, and you've got to be critical and honest with yourself on this, or obviously get somebody else to to do it. And if you're building your own website, I understand that time and money dictates that at times and I built my first website but I'll tell you it's not the best way to get good quality clients if they're looking at Google or searching through and they come across a website that's self-built versus one that's not and it's very professional there's only one winner there so review your positioning are you coming across in the right way is your profile right? And there's a strategy for improving and increasing that as well. It's a topic for another conversation. Step five is learning their language. What makes them tick? What do they struggle with? What are they scared of? What do they believe? So let's take, um, let's take a distance runner for a second. Distance runners are all about road work and, and miles. And they, they run their programs based on how many miles they're going to run this week, how many miles they're going to run next week. And we as, as experts in the field of physical preparation understand that this is not always the best way. But it does make them tick. Their problems, they, they get injured. They get overuse injuries. They're, they've got poor posture there's a lot of kinetic chain issues there. Their fears, well, they're scared of strength training very often. They're scared of putting size on, even though we know they're never going to put size on because they're doing 20 miles a week or 30, or whatever it is, 100 miles a week in some cases. So their fear is actually what we do very often. And they believe that heavy lifting makes them slower or makes them bigger we know that that's a load of tosh that's a load of nonsense but if we talk to them as s&c coach and saying yeah let's get in the gym let's get really strong we'll make you you know we'll make you lifting heavy weights and we'll get rid of all these issues that's going to scare them off instantly it's just not the way to communicate let's take a golfer as another example golfer is all about efficiency movement patterns movement quality repetition Again, if we start talking to them about big, heavy squats and um, power work, etc., that might scare them off. We've got to talk in their language. We've got to say, well, we'll clean up that movement pattern for you. We'll work on the efficiency of your swing. Where are you struggling? Where, where, what are you? Okay, I've got an exercise that will help you with this. I've got, help, I've got a program that will help you with that. I've had experience here. I've had experience there. Same thing with a rugby player. If you then use that same language with a rugby player, they're probably going to think, you know, I'm not going to get any stronger here. So it's, it's learning the language of the sport. Get on the internet, look at the common injury problems, speak to people who work with these sports, get their expertise and experience in there as well. And this learning the language will help you to craft your message more efficiently and actually get these clients. And the final step here is actually get talking to these people right now in the right language. There's nothing better than getting on the phone and actually speaking to someone in person. Turning up at the session, meet that person in person. Do your research, understand what their problems are, their fears are, their beliefs are, and then go armed with solutions to those problems. And go prepared. Maybe you've sent an email and you've sent them an article that you've written on the top five injuries in running and how to avoid them. Maybe you've sent them a reference by another coach who's endorsed you that they'll know who that person is because they might go back right to your contact map to somebody that they know that you've already worked with and you've done a great job with. You've got to go prepared. And here's the biggest statement of this entire presentation. You've got to be prepared to do the hard work that makes the selling 
easy. Right? The hard, you've got to do the hard work that makes the selling easy. You've got to get in front of someone, but that's actually very often the final point of actually sealing the deal. There's some really good psychology research to say that people don't buy from you unless they've been in contact with you between six and nine times, I believe. Six and nine times. So let's bear that in mind a second. If you've posted something on Facebook that they've seen, that might be one. You've then sent them an email and followed up with a phone call, that might be two and three. You've then written two or three more articles that they that you've made a deliberate effort to customize an email and say, what do you think of this article? That might be four, five, and six. And then you might say, are, are you free next week to catch up? I'd love to come and see you and chat, chat about how I can get working with you. That's seven. That might be eight as well. Might take a couple of meetings. And then you've got a chance to seal the deal. It's the hard work that makes the selling easy. And that's a question. Are you prepared to put that hard work in? And it is hard work, believe me. But once you get this system going, you can automate it. You can do the work. You can get it automated. You can get somebody to help you with your social media. You can get somebody to help you with your emails. You can write the content. You can drive it. Then you can finally get in front of these people and they already know who you are and, re and they're ready to go. But it's crafting the right message it's got to be in their language. You've got to have their beliefs, their fears, their problems, and you've got to be able to solve it all and get that message over to them. And that is when you can start to really accelerate your business. And if you're referring people to your website, don't just refer them to the home page. Set up a landing page that is Brendan Chaplin forward slash tennis forward slash rugby, forward slash golf, forward slash triathlon, and actually have a tailored landing page that says, I understand you, and this is how I can help you, and refer them to that page. And not only that, it's better for Google as well, because they'll rank your website more favorably when they can see that you're an expert, or you've got knowledge or valuable content on those areas. So it's the hard work that makes the selling easy, and then you start getting serious amounts of inquiries and clients. And it's doing the research to find out where these people are hanging out and then deciding which marketing pillars work the best for you. Yeah, so it's not just a simple matter of saying, let's set up some Facebook ads. It's saying, well, who's on Facebook? Are my triathletes on Facebook or not? Or are they? is it easier to reach 50 triathletes by doing an event or a presentation at their evening that says, six mistakes every triathlete makes and why you should come and train with me right now, how I can help you. Is it easier to, to write an article and, and personally mail it out in a coloured envelope to every single head coach of every single athletics club in the region or golf club or tennis club and, and, and give them a lovely piece of marketing saying, this is me, this is what I can do for you. This is how I can solve your problems. This is how I can make your tennis players even better and more competitive. Come and, you know, let's have a coffee and chat about this. That's the hard work that makes the selling easy. And that's step six, which is get talking to them. And the final step, it's a little bonus one here, but it's actually utilizing partners and referrals to broaden your network. So this is something that you can start with instantly, but it's also something that, is a complementary thing that, that steadily grows your business as well. So who else works with these people? Well, if there's a local shop that sells all their protein and supplements, then maybe do a joint event with them. And they might have 10,000 people on their mailing list that you can target as well. If there's a, a clothing shop, a running shop, an up and running, I can tell you that if you approach up and running and offer to do a free seminar, they will market it to all their runners, because I've done it, and it worked, it got me quite a few clients, look at all the areas, coffee shops, that people will hang around in, next door to running club, or, or you know all the different societies, and clubs, and teams that you're targeting, how can you partner up with them, 
And bear in mind that when you're partnering with someone, it's got to be a win-win. They've got to get something out of this as well. And so maybe you, you provide copies of your article for them to give out to people that adds value to their clients as well. It's a win-win scenario that helps you broaden your referral network and your partner network. So complementary people is really important as well. And that's step seven. So that's it, folks. That is seven steps to getting athletic clients in the next 30 days. Get going. Make it happen. And let me know how you get on. I'm sure you'll get loads of clients. Good luck with it.